Hi guys, my name is Holly Galbraith, and I'm doing my capstone on the highly endangered unarmored free spine stickleback. And it is endemic to Santa Clarita, and I'm looking at water quality and abundance of the fish. So my hypothesis is that anthropogenic influences, such as urbanization and uh, how we allocate water during drought conditions, are having a huge impact on new CS habitat, as well as a decrease in abundance and water quality. And I'm studying uh, water quality and fish abundance in five locations in Santa Clarita. Two of them are in Santa Clara River, which uh, are where the Valencia wastewater treatment plant expels its water. The other one is Boque Creek, which gets its water from a reserve. The other one is Soledad Canyon, which, gets, which, al which also gets water from a reserve. And the last one is San Francisco Canyon, which I believe gets one from a reserve as well. And I'm also going to be looking at land use around each site to see if that has an impact on water qu quality as well. So my methods, I'm collecting water quality data, as you know. And I'm going to be doing the same thing that Taylor's doing, using the SONS, the XO, uh, YFA XO2, to collect water quality. And I'm going to be surveying sites for fish abundance and looking where they are, where they're not, where they used to be, uh, stuff like that. And then I'm going to be using a GIS to correlate land use uh, around each of the sites to see if urbanization is having more of an impact on some sites than others. So these are some of my results. I couldn't fit all of the charts on here, but basically what I did was I put the sites at the bottom, and these are just kind of the uh, acronyms I have for it. So like BC is uh, Bouquet Creek. And then I, for each uh, water quality parameter, I created a chart. And this is it. Hi, my name's Dorothy Horn. Um, sharing my research with you today. I am testing things for plastic in the sand and specifically in an invertebrate called a sand crab. Everybody kind of knows what it is. If you don't, I'll show you in just a second. So the first question was, is there a beach out there without microplastics? A sandy beach ecosystem has a lot of different components to it, so we're trying to see if the beach sand itself has microplastics. And they're trying to decide which invertebrate would be the best to test. And we decide on sand crabs because one, they're a filter feeder, so they stick their little feeders out and sway in the water and then eat things that come by, as well as they actually burrow into the sand. So their effects of possible plastics would be high. So that's why we went ahead. They were easy to collect. And then whether or not the sand crabs actually ingested the plastic, since we knew that there was probably plastics, at least in their environment. My methods was a large distribution range. So we have sampling of beaches so far tested approximately 51 sites, anywhere from Marin County all the way down to San Diego in California. Some of the Channel Islands are included in that, and that's specifically for the sand. So we have 200 milliliters of sand floated in a hypersaline solution that brings the plastics up and out of it, filter it out, and then analyze uh, underneath a microscope mostly morphologically by color and size of either fibers or uh, plastic particles, and that's how I'm recording everything. As far as the sand crabs go, those sand crabs specifically are being dissected, and those we have for about 40 of those sites. And each population is a sample population of 10 crabs, and then I'm dissecting each one and looking for the same thing, either fibers or plastics, and writing down the same thing. It's all by color and size and whatnot. So this is the distribution of microplastics that we've tested so far. What you can see is in the blue are all the fibers, and the kind of yellow part is the particles. This is going from north to south, from Avila all the way across, and then these are our Channel Islands. So you can see that certain beaches have a lot more just plastics and particles in general, and then certain definitely have more particles. We found that the islands had quite a few particles. We're not sure if that maybe has to do with Flotation of larger marine debris breakdown, things like that, just a different angle depending on which way the beach faces. So that'll be a further um, investigation. And that's just a little kind of map to show you some of the lower counties that we have done of actual plastics on the beaches. This is for the sand crabs. So of those beaches so far, 20 of the sand crab populations have been tested. I've only found two sample populations with zero fibers or particles inside that I could see with a dissection scope. Everybody else has had at least 30%. So it's 1 out of 10, you'll see 30%, 70%, and so on. And this is also going from north to south in the sand crabs. That's it. All right, my name is Evan Locke, and this is my capstone project. I'm studying the impacts of trampling on uh, rocky intertidal benches in Malibu, California. Um, this here is an old picture from 2012. Uh, it displays the diversity that you have in these rocky intertidal sites. Uh, there's a disaster of sea star 
Uh, they're a little hard to come by these days, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, so what is the problem? So we live in Southern California. We have beautiful weather, beautiful beaches. We also have a large population. People like to go to the beach, especially in Malibu, where, it, where it's very beautiful. And with these high levels of visitation, there is impact. Uh, rocky intertidal ecosystems are highly diverse. They're highly productive. They're also very sensitive. Uh, they undergo a lot of disturbances, natural levels of disturbances, and now anthropogenic disturbances. Trampling is one of those examples. And here you can see this is my high impact site. It's a cut point. Lots of people. And that's a normal site, especially on a nice day on a weekend. Lots of people. Um, and just to clarify, I'm talking about humans trampling, not birds. They're OK. They're allowed there. Um, so my, my hypothesis is that more accessible beaches will have more people, and therefore, higher impact. And higher impact, uh, lower species richness. So methods. So I've selected three sites in Malibu. Uh, one of them is at Leo Creo, Saquette Point. Uh, the other one is Lechuza Point, which is adjacent to Broad Beach. And the third one is Paradise Cove, which is at Paradise Cove. Um, I selected these sites because they are, are uh, they're been selected by Marine, which is multi-agency rock eater tile network, which have been doing uh, research on these sites, some of them for almost 30 years. Um, so. I've, that's why I selected the sites. Uh, they also have differences in accessibility. I measured how far it takes to get to each site from the closest parking and also where there's available parking. Um, so, you know, red is the highest access, green is the lowest access. Um, then to quantify uh, trampling, I've set up at these sites, uh, just outside of the site, and counted how many people. And to clarify again, I'm not counting birds, they're okay. And then uh, to quantify uh, species, species richness, uh, I've used the data collected by Marine, where they do point count surveys, which is they basically survey the entire intertidal. Uh, every five centimeters, uh, they, they count everything in a five centimeter radius. So they basically cover the whole site. Um, so that's how I've got the richest counts. And here's the results. So um, in this one, you can see uh, the three different sites. Uh, red shows weekday, blue shows weekend. Um, the reason I separate them is because you get a lot more visitation on weekends. And then you can see here the species richness uh, by site. And you can see there's a correlation between visitation and richness. Higher, vi uh, higher visitation equals lower richness. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Michaela Miller. I'm going to talk about the historical and temporal changes of marine debris on Santa Rosa Island and Ventura County beaches. So basically, um, <clears throat> the main objective of my project is to remove marine debris in certain locations, also to um, quantify the amount of marine debris that washes up seasonally, and then compare that to other seasons, and then also some historical data on Santa Rosa Island. So um, some of my hypotheses are hypotheses um, that marine debris on Santa Rosa Island has increased since the early 90s, and there's a historical data set from 89 to 93 that I can compare um, this year's data to. Um, because local fisheries have definitely um, increased since then. And also there is a seasonal variation in marine debris. So some of my methods, um, I surveyed four Santa Rosa Island beaches and these beaches were selected because they're part of um, a national marine fisheries funded survey that was um, performed by the National Park Service, the Channel Islands National Park. Um, so I did those in fall and spring um, because winter time is swell and in the pinnipeds it's really hard to get out there. And then I also surveyed six mainland beaches um, in the fall, winter, and spring to give me like a mainland comparison and also just demonstrate more of the seasonal um, variation in debris. So all the debris that I collected was in 300 meter transects and it was recorded and measured. And so this is some of my results so far. I was able to um, separate the debris in one of five categories. Um, these categories were made from, um, Dan Richards from the Channel Islands National Park actually made these categories. Um, so far, this is um, fall of 1990 um, compared to like last fall, 2015. So miscellaneous plastics is still the number one um, contender of marine debris, I guess. And that's like tiny foam pieces, little hard fragments, stuff you don't really know where it comes from. And then the interesting thing that I found so far was that derelict fishing gear has increased from fi about 5% of the marine debris found um, to about 26%. Um, just in like about 25 years. So that was the most interesting thing that I found so far and I plan on looking into that further. So. Hey everyone, my name is Casey Lazell. I'm uh, doing my capstone on Barrier Beach geomorphology. And this is the Santa Clara River mouth. I'm looking at where it actually breached. 
My hypothesis is that wave energy and precipitation can actually influence where the location of that breach will occur. So you can kind of see there, I'm looking, I'm looking north, right at the, the barrier beach, and you can see over here is the Santa Clara River, and over there is the ocean. And then it's going right through. Um, here's an overview. So that last picture that I just showed you guys was was right here on the Barrier Beach, and um, yeah, so I think that that location is changing. And so this is the Santa Clara watershed right here, just to give you kind of a perspective of where you're at. Uh, methods, so a bunch of the fancy tools I use. Uh, these are the latitude and longitude of the sites that I surveyed along that uh, barrier beach. And here's my results. So over here on this side is would be where the Santa Clara River would be, and then on the far side would be the ocean. And I did a, a darker line for the more recent date and then a, a lighter line for the date that's farther back. And so you can kind of see a trend from the earlier date is the beach is bigger towards the ocean, and then when you come over here to the earlier date that's last week, you can see it's all the way pushed back here. And I'm thinking that from wave energy and all the sand has moved out actually to sea, and um, to offshore bars. And kind of a, a cool thing, I'm gonna go back to the this picture. Um, right now they're dredging at the Ventura Harbor. So there's a lot of sand that's being pushed from the Ventura Harbor right in front of the Santa Clara River Mouth. So it's gonna give me some exciting results. That's it. Hi, I'm Hayden McPherson, and I looked at how accurate citizen science can be with high school and middle school students. So my hypothesis is how accurate can it be and how much uh, of the training needs to be done with the students beforehand. So the methods that I used is I created a game called Limpid's Jenga. And how it worked is that they had to, it was basically Jenga, but they had to play with game cards and they had, it was red cards, orange cards, and green cards. Red, red cards were how, were direct impacts, orange cards were indirect impacts, and green cards meant good impacts so that they can add green cards to it and they had to build up the Jenga pile. And then uh, to test how much they were already knew, and how much they were learning. I used a site called Kahoot. It was a quiz that I created. It had 17 questions on it. it. Had a question and then the picture of the animal. And they had to look at, they had to pick the right answer. I gave that test three times. One at the very start as my baseline, one right before the field trip, and one right after the field trip. And then I also used a Quizlet to help them study along that Limpid, that the Limpids people uh, created, and Limpids was created by NOAA to help uh, with long-term monitoring. And then the results that I found with the high school students is that they did indeed learn it a little bit more over time, and will be able. And I will be looking at how much they, at how well they were actually doing out in the field at Car Carpentaria State Beach. And that's it. Hi everyone, my name is Amy and I'm doing my capstone on vegetation distribution on two watersheds on Santa Rosa Island. So the island was heavily ranched for 150 years. Um, after the removal of the ungulates, the, there was an active restoration project on Kamado watershed where they planted native species and Water Canyon watershed had no um, restoration projects, so it's recovering naturally. So I'm comparing the two watersheds to see if the 
the state of the projects and if future projects should be put in place. I did this by um, having 25 sites in Water Canyon watershed. Um, the sites show different characteristics of the stream, such as stream channel width, um, meander frequencies, and different slopes. And then I had 10 sites in Kamada watershed, which are based off of um, historical sites after they did the plannings. And for at each site, I have both vegetation data and geomorphology data that are on top of each other, so they correlate with each other. And so I start on one side of the stream channel where the total station is located. So our transects start at the same place, and it shows it in the top picture. And I go, I use the point intercept method, which is I record the species that touch the transect tape at that at that interval. So my interval is every 30 centimeters. I'll record the vegetation and the vegetation height in the substrate. And I also record the GPS coordinates at the beginning and the end, along with the elevations. And I record the elevation at the center of the stream channel as well. And when I classify my data, I split up the perennial grasses into bunch grasses and then spreading grasses and annual grasses. I just do annual grasses and the rest I classified to the genus or the species. And some of my results are that the since the removal of the ungulates, there has been an increase in uh, vegetation cover, and there's also been an increase in species richness, um, especially in the lower reaches of the watershed due to decrease in slope, and the, both watersheds have high percentages of non-native annual grasses.